Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you today, Joel? Um, you, you're going to laugh at me, but so I had the, the new air conditioning installed, Yeah. Um, which is very like, it's a lot quieter than our old system. Um, and the other one was pointing in a funny direction. So we used to have to have that plus a fan on in the bedroom to get sort of the room to be cool enough to be comfortable to sleep at night. Um, and so now the volume is significantly less than it used to be which now means that I'm waking up frequently during the night to sounds in the house that I'm not used to hearing. So You um, no longer have the white noise to drown it out. No, no. And uh, my brain isn't used to those as just being regular house sounds and just continue on sleeping. So, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of when I used to spend a lot of time on mine site sleeping in dongers and you'd have like the old wall um, units for the air cons and they were so loud. Yeah, and when they'd cycle through and like, yeah, they'd start up again and the whole thing would vibrate. Yeah. 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 But you know, you'd get used to sleeping with that sort of noise and it was great because you wouldn't hear people like getting up early in the morning and yeah. moving around and or snoring in the room next door and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, now I know where you're coming from. That's uh yep. It's a nice problem to have though. Like well, yeah, it is. It is um, you know, boo have you, have you boo thought hoo, of- my <laughs> air conditioning is efficient and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of problems, like it's probably, <laughs> yeah, it's it's on the lower end. Yeah, yeah, you're really like clutching at straws these days, aren't you? To come up with like my life's so horrible. Look, I'm I'm still tired. That's the main that's the main problem. <laughs> yeah. So have you thought about like a white noise generator or something like that? No, I'll just get used to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. All too easy. Well, um, it's not a sleep podcast it's no. a psych health and safety podcast it is. so we should probably introduce our guest yep uh she was a school leader across several schools for 15 years in bangkok berlin and hong kong so well traveled she completed a doctoral thesis in 2017 on the subject of international school leader well-being following retirement from school leadership her work now revolves around researching writing and speaking on a range of educational topics with a particular focus on school well-being she's otherwise known as the positive principal Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Helen Kelly. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me. It's really funny listening to you talking about air conditioning because I think, uh, what are we, Monday now, Saturday night, we had minus six Celsius here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that would be some sort of record in Perth if we got to negative six. I, I think that the entire economy in Perth would collapse if we got to a negative six. Um, just people would genuinely think that the apocalypse had arrived. Yeah, it, <laughs> We, we definitely don't get that kind of uh, cool. You're, you're heading into summer now, though, aren't you? Well, yeah. I mean, summer always comes in inverted commas in the UK. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, we can, we can have days in July where it's only 15 or 16 Celsius. Yeah, so it doesn't get to 40 degrees regularly like it did for pretty much the whole well, of December and January yeah. here in Perth. Yeah. No, I think 37 is the highest record temperature we've ever had, actually, and... Uh, yeah, a bit like what you just said about Perth, if it was minus six, when it gets to over 30, you know, it's like the apocalypse, the whole world comes to an end. The roads melt. Mm. <laughs> well, Helen, it's great to, <laughs> great to have you join us from on the other side of the world. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Me too. So uh, before we get into it, Helen, do you um, have any podcasts that you'd like to listen to? I do, yeah. Over the last couple of years, there have been three podcasts that I've been listening to regularly. Um, And yeah, none of them are really that connected with uh, what we're going to talk about today, maybe loosely. Um, So the first one is called Writer's Routine. Um, I'm in the process of writing my first book at the moment. um, And I've been listening to Writer's Routine, which actually is not that helpful um, to me in writing my book because it's mostly focused upon fiction writers and my book is nonfiction. Nevertheless, I quite enjoy listening to authors talk about their routine, how they organize their day, how they go about writing, um, you know, writing their books. It's it's something that I listen to a lot when I'm driving. Um, The second one is Yoga Talks by Jay Brown. And this is a real nerdy one. Um, This is for people that are interested in yoga philosophy and, you know, the kind of deeper elements of yoga off, off the mat, as we say in the yoga world. 
Um, and Jay Brown is a well-known yoga practitioner in the States who um, interviews a lot of other well-known yoga nerds. Um, yeah, so it's a, you know, just nerd fest for yoga, basically. Um, and then the third one, which is a lot more well-known, is 10% Happier Dan Brown, uh, which you're both nodding. Um, so I've been listening to him for a few years now. And, you know, his podcast started with a focus upon meditation, but now he's expanded to a lot of other kind of mental well-being related um, issues. And he speaks to a lot of nerds as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think actually all three of those podcasts are quite nerdy, aren't they? <laughs> that, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with a nerdy podcast. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we like nerdy podcasts here. We do, yes. <laughs> uh, so can you tell us about your professional career, please? Yeah, well, my work in life began not in education, actually. Um, I began work in the late 80s after I left uh, university. Uh, I was a solicitor in the UK um, and I was working for a company that had really developed as part of the labour movement in the early part of the 20th century. So it was very kind of right on and progressive kind of lefty politics involved there. And uh, what we did was we acted for trade union members um, who would had accidents at work or who'd contracted industrial diseases. Um, things like mesothelioma and asbestosis, industrial deafness, that kind of stuff. And there was a real commitment in the organisation to improve, the, improve health and safety at work generally. And, you know, back then we were working with um, common law, um, negligence um, law, and also legislation going back to the 1960s, the Factories Act. But then in the early 1990s, all this wonderful legislation came in from the EU, um, which afforded um, workers a lot more rights. Um, and so it was a great time to be working in that field. But then, um, in the uh, late 90s, my husband and I decided that we wanted to travel and work and he was an engineer and I was a, a lawyer and that didn't really fit together. So we both requalified to become teachers. And my first job was actually working in Cairo um, in an international school. And for the next 21 years, I worked primarily in international schools overseas, short two year stint in the UK, which I didn't enjoy. And for 15 years of that time, I was a school principal um, and I was a principal in three schools, firstly in uh, Bangkok for six years and then in Berlin uh, for three years and then in Hong Kong for four years um, and eventually getting to a point where I uh, was responsible for over a thousand students and over a hundred staff. Um, and interestingly, in 2013, I started studying for my doctorate. And um, I decided to focus upon school leader well-being because back then, what, nine years ago, no one was talking about this really, especially in international schools. You know, there was some research, academic research, but it really wasn't in the public domain. Um, and so that's when I started really getting interested in, you know, school well-being, particularly leader and teacher well-being. And once I'd finished my thesis and delivered that, I founded my website, The Positive Principle, and I started writing articles, um, which attracted a lot of attention. Um, and then I also was invited to present at conferences and deliver webinars, that kind of stuff. And then I started carrying out my own research um, during the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, they say doctors make the worst patients. And so unfortunately in 2019, I actually experienced an occupational burnout. And as a result of that, I made the decision to retire from my work in schools. And so I worked for an, another year. And then in the uh, summer of 2020, smack bang in the pandemic, um, I retired from my job as a principal. And my intention then was to have a quiet life. But of course, there's an enormous amount of need in the field of you know teacher and school leader well-being um, and so I found myself conducting research to fill gaps um, and working with schools consulting supporting individuals um, with their well-being 
And so it's been quite um, a whirlwind really for the last year and a half, nearly two years now since I retired from schools. And so uh, I wouldn't say that I'm doing this full time. I still have plenty of leisure time, um, but it's interesting now. I work with schools from all over the world um, in multiple sectors, state, you know, state schools, um, independent schools, um, international schools. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Fantastic. That's a, um, a bit of a winding career path, which I love to, to hear about. I think it's, you know, it's fantastic to hear about, um, people who, who don't just sort of progress through the normal, um, the normal pathway in, into a career and into, into where they end up. So, um, yeah, I always love when our guests have a bit of a diverse background. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, spending the majority of your life living overseas also kind of, you know, um, makes you a bit different. Um, it gives you a, an amazing perspective. And I think it's really helped me to understand that while, you know, we all know, and I'll probably talk about this a bit more later, there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to workplace well-being. And all of these different sectors and different countries and, you know, different types of schools all have and each individual school has their own unique issues but actually what I've learned over the last 10 years is that there are themes general themes that are broadly similar regardless of where people are working and I think that's been quite helpful yeah absolutely um now Helen uh we work a bit in schools ourselves uh, as you've just alluded to there is so much work to be done uh, so much need in schools for both student and staff well-being uh, but what brought you to our attention was an article that you wrote that I saw on LinkedIn and it was called teachers are not to blame for their own burnout uh, which yeah. was a, a very inflammatory kind of title but right down our own line of, of thinking in relation to you know burnout being an occupational phenomenon um, but can you tell us what prompted you to write that article yeah, actually, that title, um, originally, it was an article written for Wellbeing in International Schools magazine. And the original title, my title, was The Myth of the Resilient Educator. And I had already written an article about a year and a half ago, The Myth of the Resilient Child. Um, and then the, the article was picked up uh, by school management and they actually came up with that new title, which I think was much more eye catching. And as a result of that, it got a lot of reshares. But, you know, as I said to you earlier, um, you know, I already had a background in this. Mostly, most of my interest has been in school leader well-being, but in, increasingly in teacher well-being. And when I first started out, really, I saw my role and I shaped and fashioned my role as someone who was raising awareness. And that's what I was most interested in. You know, I, I think of myself as a, primarily as a researcher um, and a writer. Um, in a journalistic style that's you know the, the role of the journalist isn't to come up with solutions is it it's to raise awareness and that's what I was most interested in um, but then as we kind of you know pushed on through the pandemic the need for solutions became you know increased um, and people were coming to me all the time for you know solutions and um you know, we've alluded before um, in our conversation the other day, Jason, to uh, the limitations of the self-care approach. And I must admit, when I was first asked to come up with solutions, the self-care approach made me feel very uncomfortable. And I think that that's a lot to do with my background in workplace health and safety. Um, I think firstly, I understood that self-care, you know, approaches offer limited solutions but also I think what's made me feel the most uncomfortable was that by focusing upon self-care you know teachers building resilience placing the responsibility on teachers you're giving employers a free pass and you're allowing them to abnegate their responsibility towards their employees which was very much against everything I believed in and the background that I had come from um, in the legal profession. And so I was a bit stuck at first, you know, if you'd come to me two years ago, I was a bit stuck as to where to go with the solutions. Um, and then I started researching for my book, which was commissioned about 
15 or 16 months ago. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my book more later, I think. But while researching for my book, I got much deeper into the work of Maslach and Leiter and other researchers who have used Maslach and Leiter's work as a framework for their own, you know, a springboard for their own research. And finally, I had an evidence base um, to, you know, to establish, demonstrate that actually stress and burnout in the workplace are issues of the system and the organization and not primarily issues of the individual and therefore solutions had to be focused upon the system and the organization rather than upon the individual and once i started to pick my way through that you know the scales fell from my eyes really i like you know a light bulb moment and that really helped me to understand how i could de start developing solutions you know, particularly for schools as organizations. And when I use the word schools, I mean, as a collaborative process between governance, leadership and staff to develop, you know, organizational approaches to um, reduce stress and prevent and mitigate against burnout. And so that was really what prompted that article was to help schools to be aware of this and hopefully to prompt them to think in different ways about their well-being programs for teachers and leaders. Yeah, and I think it's such an important insight and you have the ideal background, I guess, to be able to share that insight, uh, given that, you know, you've been a school leader for so long yourself, have that workplace health and safety and legal background, um, and yes. obviously are very good at communicating with school leaders about these things. Um, because there are yeah, heaps of solutions in the school space regarding resilience and well-being and social emotional uh, type skills, uh, all focus on individual behaviours. But like you say, it kind of abnegates the, uh, the employer from any responsibility of creating a healthy workplace that doesn't harm people or make them ill in the first place. So um, yeah, really interesting and really glad that you're, uh, you're taking that, that framework and, and bringing that to schools. Yeah, I feel so comfortable with it now. It makes perfect sense for me. And it also, it took me a long time to realize, actually, I know it sounds obvious now, but it took me a long time to realize that what, the reason I'd become interested in this was because of the background that I had in my first career. And this was just picking that up and, you know, from where I left off in a way. And of course, back then, in the late 80s to late 90s you know stress in the workplace was th th there was no there was no framework at all for that it was really very much something that we talked about that was in its absolute infancy um and i think that things have moved on quite a bit um and you know even if there was an, isn't a legislative framework as 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 kind of robust as we would like it to be there's a there's a research foundation there now for us to use um and to, to help us to develop tools um and so yeah i'm really glad i've come back to this it feels natural feels like it was meant to be yeah it's interesting right because uh you know you referenced maslach and lighter there and obviously we've had michael lighter on uh recently on the podcast as well to talk about a bit about burnout and incivility um and that research goes back decades, right, um, regarding Absolutely. burnout and the, the workplace's, I guess, involvement, I guess, in, in burnout rather than just the individual's inability to cope. Um, but you see, and I've definitely seen it um, being involved with schools myself, you have wellbeing academics who will come up with terms like contextual wellbeing or uh, a more recent one I've seen is systems and informed positive psychology. And yeah. all they're really talking about is, you know, work design and psychosocial risk management. <laughs> like, well, oh, kind of yeah. put a new term on it to fit into the well-being kind of framework that they, they live in uh, or the world that they live in. But it's like, well, no, it, there's a whole field of psychology devoted to this area. Absolutely. You know, before I already had this, I already felt this in my bones, if you like, before I had the research kind of framework to hang it all on. And when I was working with my staff in my school in Hong Kong, you know, maybe five years ago, I was talking then about what about if we create an environment where everybody can flourish? 
um, but I didn't have the kind of research to hang it on at the time, but I knew that that was what made sense. Um, and that's what we're talking about, isn't it? We're, in talk, we're talking really about improving working conditions. And, you know, the thing that improved physical health and safety conditions um, in the 20th century um, was, was, le was legislation, basically. Um, employers sat up and took notice because they knew that if they didn't, they could be sued. You know, you have workers' compensation in... Um, in Australia, you know, but in the UK, we have a, um, you know, we have a whole legal profession built around um, civil litigation for this. And um, we don't have that yet, do we, for um, mental health risks. And so we have to persuade employers in other ways to demonstrate to them the bottom line benefits, whether that be financial, or in schools, the bottom line is student outcomes, isn't it? That's the core purpose of the school. And actually, even in the state school system, student outcomes impact the bottom line as well, because we're all, you know, we're all, it's a competitive environment and we're all competing for the same students. And mm. if our exam results are good, which is what everybody wants, whether that should be, whether that's right or wrong, you know, exam results is where it's at. Um, if student outcomes are positive, then families will want to come to the school and the school will be successful. And so it's just helping schools to understand how the well-being of their staff impacts the bottom line, because we don't have yet have a framework of legislation, um, you know, hanging over employers. Yeah, so that, that's part of the carrot, right? Like looking at what are the things that the company is interested in? What are the um, outcomes that are expected or desired? And then how does wellbeing kind of map onto that? Uh, in Australia, obviously, we do have new regulations that are coming out at the moment. So uh, Victoria, like, yeah. Ha, yeah, have released their draft regulations on psychological health and we're expecting the Commonwealth ones imminently. Um, so yeah, we will have more of a stick approach and the regulators are hiring a lot of psychologists who will no doubt be enforcing the new regs as, as they come out. Um, so I, look, hopefully, like you said, you know, when it came to physical health, what really drove behavioral change for employers was legislation. So hopefully this helps, uh, starting here in Australia. Um, but I just, just conscious of the fact that there's not a lot of research regarding school teacher burnout there's quite a bit around school leader burnout and you know phil riley in australia does a fair bit of work on principal well-being here um but do you have any statistics on um how large the burnout issue is for school teachers either in uk or internationally yeah i mean as you say it's an under-researched field in in a sense um there's a lot of research you know going back a few decades about the causes of teacher burnout but not the incidence of teacher burnout but we you know we do have some data um so you know what we know is probably about half of all teachers might experience burn are likely to experience burnout at some point in their career um but we also know that probably around about 15 percent of teachers experience high levels of burnout. We know a few other things as well. We know that when teachers come into the profession as novice teachers, you know, I'm thinking about the Maslach and Leiter engagement burnout um, continuum. When teachers come into the profession as novice teachers, they come in at the engagement end, you know, <laughs> hopefully they're not already moving towards <laughs> burnout before they've even started. Um, and what we know is that they can move pretty quickly through those profiles of exhausted and overextended and ineffective, you know, in whatever order that that might come for the individual towards burnout quite quickly. And we know that retention of teachers within the profession is actually quite closely connected to this. So what we also know is that across most of this data comes from the UK and the US. About one in six teachers leave at the end of the first year, leave the profession. Wow. Yeah. And then within three years, about 25% are leaving. And then in, within five years, about a third are leaving. And what tends to happen with those novice teachers is they become burnt out very quickly. 
um, they don't pace themselves or take time off sick. They just work harder to try to push through the problems that they're encountering. And as a result, they burn out. Um, what we also know is that this isn't the case for more experienced or veteran teachers. So teachers who get through that initial stage um, and they've, they've been in the profession for five years or more, what tends to happen with those individuals is that they will pace themselves more and they will take time off sick, but they don't leave. So what we've got effectively are millions of teachers around the world who are working while they are burnt out. And we know that there are, you know, there's some, some good research coming out now. You, the University of York in the UK, some fabulous research just from, uh, from 2020. We're starting to understand the impacts of this, not just on teacher turnover, but just to talk about turnover a little bit. What we know about turnover is not only are teachers more likely to um, leave the profession if they're burnt out, but we also know that for teachers, um, for schools, teacher retention is also directly linked to student outcomes. So when we have schools where there's a lot of turnover, what we tend to have are lower student outcomes. And that's the case even for students who are taught by teachers who've been in their post for years. So actually the turnover of teachers impacts the teachers that stay. Um, it impacts the culture of the school, it impacts collaboration, it impacts a whole bunch of things. So teacher turnover isn't just about the cost of replacing teachers, it's about the impact on the quality of the work that schools are doing. What we also know now, and this great uh, stuff that's come from York University, a, a meta-analysis of studies that involved 5,000 teachers and 50,000 students, um, we know that teachers who are burnt, students who are taught by teachers who are burnt out, um, have poorer outcomes. So they have poorer exam results. They're also more likely to display disruptive behavior. They're less motivated. Um, and also really interesting, although we haven't managed yet to, pr to prove a direct connection through contagion theory between teacher burnout and student burnout, what we have got is evidence pointing to students who are taught by burnt out teachers exhibiting more physiological signs of stress, such as increased levels of cortisol. So we've got a whole package of stuff there that we do know. We've got some data on the incidence of burnout, and we've also got a growing body of research around how this impacts schools, which I think is quite, um, um, I, yeah, well, interesting <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, well, it's eye opening and, and it really should send alarm bells. I mean, there's a lot of schools that are very conscious around student wellbeing and they'll have quite elaborate programs, invest a lot of time and resources into these programs. Um, but they won't necessarily have the same level of care or attention to staff wellbeing. And if it is staff wellbeing, it might be, well, let's run a day or two of staff PD on resilience. It's not like looking at the systems that are broken that are causing them to burn out in, in the first place. Um, so if we're looking at what is more important for student outcomes, is it, you know, wellbeing programs in the school or is it, you know, teachers not burning out so they and not turning over so they get higher quality education? They're both yeah. important, right? But why? Yeah. But one seems to get a lot more attention than the other. Well, I think there's a way to connect those two things. They're not separate, are they? It's like in the book that I'm writing at the moment about school leader well-being, you can't separate out school leader well-being from teacher well-being because they have a knock-on effect. And likewise, you can't separate out student well-being from the well-being of um, teachers and leaders. And in international schools in particular, you can't separate any of that out from parent well-being either because parents are a very important part of the school community. Um, but the way to kind of you know, uh, link all of that together is through positive school culture. And 
if you have a positive, you know, if you're you're intentionally setting about to develop a positive school culture, this is going to impact positively on leaders, teachers, parents, and students, and other staff. We're not just talking about academic staff either, are we? We're talking about non-academic staff. Um, so I think that you know, for example, we started a program of positive education in my school in Hong Kong. I drove that, and. I felt very strongly that for the first year that had to be focused, you know, entirely on staff. So first of all, that's because of the connection between staff well-being and student well-being, but also if staff are working with these tools and strategies for the, their own benefit first, it helps them to understand them better. So if you're using character strengths, for example, and you're going to move forward with using that with your students, it's much better to spend a year just doing that with staff. You know, so I don't think that it has to be an either or. There are approaches that we can use that link all of this together. And I think that the forward thinking schools, the schools that get it, are understanding that, but they are nowhere near enough. We're really just the majority of them are ticking a box, and want want some of them care what staff think. They want to give staff the impression that they care about them, but they don't care about them enough to make the meaningful change that needs to happen. You know, mm. so I think we've got we've still got a long, long, long way to go. Yeah, we, we learned pretty early on when we started working with schools, this came back to 2014, that we needed to pivot our approach. We had plenty of schools who wanted to use our school product for students, um, but they didn't want to use it with staff. And um, so what we did was bring in a policy that we wouldn't allow you to use it with students unless you were using it with staff as well. <laughs> so like you say, doing this whole school approach versus just focusing on the students, because we just knew it wouldn't be effective if you're not bringing staff along for the, the ride as well. And now we are seeing some schools who are, you know, bringing in for staff a full year ahead of bringing with students like you did in Hong Kong uh, to give them the skills, the language, you know, the ability to practice some of these interventions out on themselves before sharing it with students. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are a couple of things at play there. You know, I think, first of all, we have to bear in mind that the, the, the individuals who, who are often responsible for improving teacher well-being are school leaders. The school leaders are exhausted and finding it difficult to sustain the, the workload and demands that they're experiencing. And so, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna focus upon students because it's hard, you know, they've already got a lot to do. The other thing to bear in mind though, I think, is that those outside of, directly outside of schools who are responsible for this, school governance, governments, public opinion or whatever, there's still a lot of anti, educator sentiment going on and I think a lot of that stems from the fact that everyone perceives that teachers have 13 weeks holiday a year and therefore why should they be burnt out you know they don't have to you know work and they finish at 3 30 every day and I think it's a lack of understanding among even those in school governance um, certainly those in government and the population at large of just what's involved in working in schools, just how challenging it is and just how close to being overwhelmed many people are. And I think it's only really been through the pandemic that we've started seeing awareness being raised around this. And I think what many need to understand is that this didn't just happen through the pandemic. This has been going on for decades. And it's not going to stop when the pandemic stops, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, a lot got found out in the pandemic. We found out how overloaded our hospital systems and our healthcare workers were already before the burnout, uh, before the pandemic. And now we've had, you know, two years of them having to work through that in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and then teachers coming into our homes through Zoom uh, with distance or remote education um, I think, and, and um, you know, parents having to do a little bit themselves, starting to recognise, or oh, oh, maybe teachers do actually have a hard time. Absolutely. So, um, I guess getting back to the um, the article that you wrote um, on teachers and burnout, and given that the majority of school based interventions are focused on that individual self care um, focus, how? What, what was the reception like for your article? 
Well, it's interesting. There are three articles I've written in the last couple of years that have received the most attention. The first one was about the loneliness of international school leaders, and that was read by thousands and thousands of people. Then the second one was the myth of the resilient child, which prompted this original article, the myth of the resilient educator. And, that, and, and in the same way, this article also really kind of grabbed people. And this has now been my most reshared article on social media. So it's garnered a lot of attention. Um, I've seen a few organisations coming to me in the last few weeks, wanting to take a more systemic approach, but, but most of them still just want a box to tick, you know, but it takes time for these ideas to permeate, doesn't it? And I think what we need as well are some, uh, some role models. We need some high profile schools to take this on and show others how it can be done i mean you know the whole idea of happiness in schools went back to wellington college in the in, you know in the uk i mean i know you've got g long you know doing fantastic work yeah with um, anthony but, selden there yeah yeah but anthony selden did a, amazing work you know what mm. we're talking about 30 years ago maybe um promoting happiness in schools and he was a very high profile headmaster in a very high profile school in the uk um, which meant he got a lot of media attention, you know, even on the kind of six o'clock news and things like that. So what we need are some high, high profile schools or groups of schools um, to really take this on so that others can see how it can be done and learn from those models. And I'm working with a couple of groups of schools at the moment who I think really do get it. And hopefully, but it's early days. Hopefully a couple of years down the line, we'll be able to use those schools as models of how this can be done. Because I think, you know, schools do want solutions, but it all just seems too hard, too expensive, too time consuming. Yeah, yeah and I guess they want they want the evidence to to show that um, that, that investment of their, their time and, and effort is actually going to have the, the benefits. Absolutely. And, you know, all of the data that we have on ROI, you know, return on investment all comes from the corporate world. We don't have any of that in schools at the moment. Um, and, you know, so we do need to have, as you said, a kind of body of evidence to draw upon, which I think will move things forward. And hopefully I think was, you know, we're getting towards that now, but it's still slow. Yeah, so hopefully in the next year, we'll be able to share some um, research findings from our clinical trial with Monash University on school teacher mental health in Victoria. So that was part of a work well funded initiative. And there's about 30 schools involved. So talking about a, a body of schools or, you know, a number of schools taking more of a systemic approach and then researching the benefits of that. Yeah, hopefully there's a bit of data we'll be able to share, um, you know, with our listeners and with people like yourself, who can then disseminate that and go, well, look, there is schools doing this and these are the benefits that yeah. they're realizing that's great there's some great work going on in victoria you know also with school principals you know i i refer to this in my book and um yeah it's good um you know australia really have been leading the charge you know in school well-being um from a whole range of perspectives you know including the great work that geelong has been doing and uh, the university in melbourne and um you know, working alongside Martin Seligman and yeah, some great stuff been going on there. So uh, we've got a lot to learn from you. So Helen, you're also writing a book on school leader wellbeing. Um, so how, before we get into your book, how is principal wellbeing in general? Yeah, pretty poor. <laughs> um, there's more data on this, as you alluded to earlier, um, you know, both from the UK and from um, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, the great work that Phil Riley and his team have been doing. Um, they also did some work in, in Ireland back in 2015. I'm not, that was just a one-off. I'm not sure why they haven't done that since. Um, but what we know is that um, from UK data, we know that the well-being of um, head teachers, as we call them in the UK, um, the levels of well-being are considerably lower than those in, in the general population. Um, and what Phil Riley's team found um, in Australia was that uh, levels of burnout of school principals are about 1.7 uh, 
um, the level of uh, the general workforce. Yeah, so almost so, double. Yeah, almost double. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, pretty poor. I think is a, a kind of simple answer to that. Yeah, very poor by the sounds. Of it. Yeah, very. <laughs> uh, what would you say are some of the main psychosocial factors that are relevant for school principals? Well, you know, if we use the Maslach and Leiter kind of model of the six areas of work life, I think that's a good model to use. Um, we know that for school principals, there are two areas of work life that are most closely associated with burnout. The first one, number one, is community. And the second one, number two, is workload. So community, there are, you know, a couple of areas there that I think are the most significant. The first one, and I think this is the thing that shocks people the most, they, the, the average person who's never been a school principal doesn't understand this, is the relationships with adults, particularly the relationships with teachers and parents, the research shows, are incredibly demanding. Schools are what I called in my, um, my, own, my own thesis, emotional arenas. Um, they are highly emotional places. And uh, one researcher, um, Megan Crawford, said that school leaders are conduits through which all the emotions in schools flow. So basically, you're dealing with highly emotional interactions on a daily basis with teachers and parents. And that is incredibly draining. And school leaders are not trained in how to deal with these kinds of issues. When they first come into school leadership, they're quite shocked that this is, this takes up such a big part of their day and that this is so impactful on their mental health. My GP in Hong Kong, when um, it was, you know, realized I, I was burnt out, said to me, I'm, you know, I have, I get so many school leaders in here and I don't really understand why, because I've always thought how lovely it would be to work with healthy children. And I said, well, to be honest with you, my job doesn't really involve working with children. I work with 120 adult, you know, adult teachers and hundreds of parents who are all highly emotional. And she was really quite shocked. It was such a small part of my job is actually interacting with students. So I think that that's one part of the community component. The second part of the community component is about isolation. So school leadership is very isolating and it's very hard for school leaders, whether they be principals or vice principals or others in senior leadership roles, to have peers in the workplace that they can trust and confide in and receive support from. So we get this structural isolation where unless you're lucky enough to work in a big school with a large leadership team, which I have been lucky enough to do, you, you know, head teachers or principals in a small school, they might be the only one and they've got no one else to talk to. And even if you do have a large leadership team, the person who's at the top, that would be the principal or the head teacher, will still often find it hard to seek support and confide in their vice principals and so on. So it becomes very, very isolating. What I've also found in my research on international schools is because principals are living away from their support networks, you know, in overseas countries, there's often also a huge component of personal loneliness as well as professional loneliness. And, you know, we all know the impact that loneliness has on our mental and physical health. So I think that's the, that's the component um, relating to community. The other component relates mostly to workload. And I think also most people don't understand just how much the work of the school principal has changed over the last half a century. The role of schools has changed considerably and the expectations placed on schools has just grown exponentially. And what began as somebody who was initially a building manager or a lead teacher or an administrator, these people now have this massive role um, that is, if you imagine a CEO of a company and all the things that they're responsible for, but they're not just responsible for overseeing all of those areas, they're responsible for physically doing them. That's what you have in schools. 
Um, and as a result of the intensification of the role, um, you know, the massive growth in, in expectations, um, what we know from the research is that school leaders work very long hours, considerably longer than the OECD average. Um, many school leaders work over 60 hours a week in school. Their work is very fast paced and their day is regularly interrupted and unpredictable. And these are all factors connected to burnout. What we also know is because of the growth of technology, school leaders don't have the opportunity to switch off at weekends or in the evenings or even in the holidays as much as people think they do. So WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and all of these things mean that they're just constantly on all the time. You know, when I was a principal, um, I had a team. I was lucky, you know, I worked in a big school. And so we had to agree that, you know, one, one night a week, one of us was putting the phone in the drawer at 6.30 and not touching it and someone else was going to pick up the messages because the messages the dings will just keep coming through all evening um and so i think you know those are the main um psychosocial factors that impact on school leader burnout yeah the um i yeah i i think the emotional work involved there um is probably something that most people wouldn't really think about you know if you think you think about a school leader and you think about more of the administrative components of actually keeping a school operational and the financial aspects of it and you know managing enrollments and all of those types of things but um yeah when you say it it is actually a lot of that um and that deep emotional work as well where you do you are dealing with the problems that your staff are bringing to you and you're dealing with parents who are yeah all, all, all sorts of interesting parents, I'm sure, um, principals deal with and, you know, um, families who are going through traumatic experiences and, you know, grief and, and all of those types of things that, um, that happen as well. So, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's definitely an area that probably most people wouldn't really think about that, that level of deep emotional work that, um, that school leaders yeah. and principals need to do. I mean, as far as teachers are concerned as well, it isn't just teachers bringing problems, it's teachers creating problems. So, you know, there's a lot of research going back to the early 90s to show that um, for, for teachers, their professional and personal identity is much more closely interlinked than most professions. So when you're, when you're bringing educational reform into school and you're asking teachers to do their jobs differently, you're not just... Um, you, you might not just be interpreted as criticizing them professionally, but you can be interpreted as attacking them personally. Um, and so you have a highly sensitive workforce. You know, let's face it, in order to do the work that they do, especially in primary schools with the youngest kids, you have to be a special kind of person who wears their emotions pretty close to the surface. And as a consequence, that makes teachers very challenging to, you know, to work with um but it couldn't be any other way but i think most people don't understand that and i know so many of people have said to me in the past oh you know my husband or my wife or my brother has said to me if people in my workplace carried on the way your teachers do nobody would stand for it it's just ridiculous um but schools are very very unique environments emotional arenas um where you have to be very careful in the way that you handle your interactions with individuals and you know on the whole school principals are not trained for that and what happens as we know from our knowledge of psychology is that when you have an emotional interaction with an individual you ruminate over it and so you take it home with you and you can't switch off because you're thinking about what was said and how it was said and what will you do about it and if that happens to you every day and my own research shows that there's you know probably 30 percent of school leaders have some kind of emotional interaction of this kind on a daily basis or more frequently than daily then you you know you're you're constantly in a loop of 
anxiety, rumination over these emotional encounters that you've had, which makes it hard. It's it's an interesting one because we've had, I think, a similar um, issue brought up, um, you know, when we've had people on talking about the legal profession that, um, you know, again, psychologists are trained in how to actually um, sort of self-reflect on their own um, emotions following an encounter or, a, you know, being told about something traumatic or whatever that might be. And as part of our professional training, we actually have a toolkit of how to deal with that. Now, how well we access that toolkit and, and, and use it is, you know, variable, um, but that is actually just a necessary part of our training to, to work in that context. And, um, you know, lawyers don't have that training. And so for them, as, as with teachers, you know, they're sort of confronted with this um, barrage of emotional responses that they just don't know what to do with or, or, or how to do it. So um, that's an interesting theme coming through there. Yeah, you know, they, and they tend to, what happens when this goes wrong is that you you beat yourself up because you think you're failing in leadership. And once you've been doing it for a while, you realise that all school leaders go through this. There's a piece of research um, that talks about wounding school leaders, the woundings that they experience. And you have to learn how to heal those wounds quickly otherwise you know you've, you're constantly being wounded and taking this all of this too personally and thinking it's your fault when what you have to do is go into a corner lick your wounds heal your wounds and bounce back um and providing school leaders with support and tools to enable them to do that more quickly is you know that's just not that's just not available on the whole Mm. Um, so are there differences in the, the main psychosocial factors between school leaders and teachers in terms of what, what, what are the main issues for them? Yeah, uh, yes and no. The research shows that the two main factors are the same. They are community and workload, but they're switched around so that for teachers, it's more to do with workload and then community comes second. But also there's a third area of work life for teachers, which is control. So a lot of issues for teachers around lack of autonomy over their work, you know, constant educational reform and change in schools, also top down leadership approaches, teachers not being involved with the direction of the school, they're, you know, being insufficient um, focus upon providing shared values and shared vision and mission so that there's a sense of belonging. Um, and more a feeling that this is something that's being done to us by leadership or by government. So we ha- we see that less with school leaders because obviously school leaders have a lot more control over their workplace um, in some ways, although the unpredictability of their days, you know, does impact on their control. So yes, similar in some ways, but also c- the control factor is different. Yeah, and that's interesting because we know that, um, you know, autonomy can be a, um, a sort of buffering factor for where, where workload is high. If you've also got high autonomy, then, you know, it's, it's less problematic um, than if, yeah, if you've got high workload and low autonomy. So that's a, um, a, a yeah, bit absolutely. of a killer combination for, for teachers to be um, dealing it with. It is. And what you do have with teachers, though, is they have that supportive community. Mm. So you have that collegial peer relationship, which is really important. And actually, I kind of poo-pooed this when I first came across it, but I understand it a lot more now that schools are more successful where teachers have relationships that are akin to close friendships or familial relationships rather than just professional relationships. Um, And, you know, I thought that that was highly unprofessional when I first came across that, but I understand it better now. And that's something that school leaders just on the whole don't have access, you know, generally don't have access to, but teachers do, which, you know, does help to mitigate against the impact of the other factors that make them vulnerable to burnout. Yeah, that's interesting. And that, I guess, for a, for a school leader is something that they can facilitate among their teaching staff as well as to actually, you know, create that environment of collegiality and where those types of relationships are actually fostered and encouraged 
Absolutely. And so much of the work that I'm doing with schools at the moment is around that. You know, whilst there are schools that just want to have a tick box, you know, um, workshop, um, the schools that I choose to work with on the whole are those that want to develop this positive school culture that I was referring to earlier. So that starts off with developing a positive workplace culture and that can then be, you know, pushed out into the student body. Um, and so, yes, developing those collegial relationships, respectful, civil, you know, Michael Leiter was talking about civility. I love that work, um, creating that sense of belonging. Um, it, 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 I think that's the best work. That's the most important work and uh, the most impactful. Mm. So you said that um, community followed by workload are the two biggest psychosocial hazards for school leaders. Um, yeah. yeah. What are your general recommendations to school leaders and to deal with some of these psychosocial factors in their role? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, what we have to do is educate. I think that we need to kind of change thinking. You know, we've discussed this a little bit already. So school communities, whether that be governance, parents, school leaders, teachers, whoever, need to understand how important school leader well-being is to the success of the school because if we don't start with that then we've got no foundation to build upon we've got no intention or motivation so i think educating the school community to understand how the well-being of the school leader is connected to the success of the school i think is probably the first thing and then I think probably the best thing schools can do because it impacts the well-being of both leaders and teachers is to focus upon developing a positive workplace culture, you know. Um, but then there are a lot of um, other things that can be done. Um, you know, those are community, but that's a community based thing, mostly from a workload perspective, um, you know, looking at ways to disperse leadership. Um, more widely across the organization, um, developing collaborative cultures, professional cultures, um, you know, has all kinds of benefits. It reduces the workload of school leaders, but it has benefits for others who are being empowered. So it's a win-win situation. Um, I think that there's a lot of stuff around that. And then providing support outside of school because te because leaders can't receive it in school so making sure that they have access to programs like mentoring coaching networking i think is absolutely crucial um lots of work around that um i think as well there's a chapter in my book um which is about you know this is more mo moving towards the self-care approach but it's helping school leaders to understand, to be self-aware and reflect upon themselves and the way that they, they, they carry out their leadership practice to understand their, their psychological drivers and what the pitfalls might be of, you know, being a perfectionist or, you know, self-sabotage behaviours, that kind of thing. So, you know, we're going down more towards this kind of self-care end there but i think that you know there are lots of things um that schools can do um i think we have to start though with you know where we started at the beginning of this conversation with schools understanding that there is no one size fits all approach for well-being in the workplace and so what they need to do is find out what the needs of their leaders are and what most schools don't have is a well-crafted um workplace well-being survey that's tailored to the needs of school leaders and i think that that's an important starting point because there's no point going down the path of all these interventions that i've just outlined whether they be primary or secondary interventions without really knowing what are the issues in our school and of course there you know i'm sure you come across this in your work there are issues of trust there so in order to encourage school leaders to be honest about the issues, there needs to be a trusting environment. Um, and that can be problematic for some schools. So I think, you know, finding out what the issues are, developing a strategic approach, organisational interventions that improve the quality of the workplace for everyone, 
um, and then focus specifically on trying to disperse leadership and trying to provide support um, for leaders. Also training, you know, providing them with the training so that they have the skills and the, uh, the, the kind of attitudes that they need to be able to do, the understandings that they need to be able to do their job well. So we're not just talking about the, the skills that you would think of with school leadership being a lead, a, a, you know, leading learning curriculum and those things, um, but training school leaders in those emotional factors, how to, in, you know, deal with difficult people, how to um, have successful interpersonal relationships, that there's very, you know, Phil Riley's doing some great work on that at the moment in Australia, but that kind of um, training isn't available in the rest of the world. It's just not there, you know, so. Well, you could argue yeah. a lot of it's gone digital over the pandemic. So um, a lot of it should be accessible. But what I'm hearing there, Helen, is, is um, probably a role for the principals themselves, given their high levels of autonomy um, and often, you know, they're the top of the chain it's not a like how we normally would address psychosocial hazards in that you know it's the employer's responsibility primarily to deal with them to identify them and deal with them um for the school leader uh they need to recognize what the factors are and, and how to address them and like you say it starts with education um but i also like that idea about that peer support so setting up a network of other school leaders uh, where you can learn from each other's experiences. And particularly if, you know, you're new into school leadership, you know, being able to be partnered with a mentor or someone who's been there and been done it successfully for a while with healthy practices, I think is really important. Um, the second responsibility there is probably with the governance of the school, um, yeah. the school, school boards, the school boards should be going, well, what are we doing to protect, you know, the school board has one um, employee, really, that's the CEO or the, uh, the, the head, the head teacher, um, what are we doing to make sure that this person's job is suitable for them and, and the demands are suitable? And what are we doing to empower that person and educate them on you know, crafting the role so it doesn't end up hurting them or harming their health? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I find quite frustrating is that virtually none of my work is with governance. And really that's where the work needs to come because you can't expect school leaders to... Um, to be very good at putting themselves first and to spend money and take time off to attend to their own needs when there are so many other needs in school what that needs to be driven by their supervisors whoever they are and you know the set the the the, the, the kind of terminology is different wherever you work in the world school leader principal supervisors need to be the individuals that are driving that yet very very little of my work is with governance and those are the people that need to be listening and need to be trained and need to be involved and government of course mm, yeah because government often is the employer when you look at the um the government schools yep yeah. So, you know, government can can lead the way, but individual in the UK, we have a system, obviously, where there's government, but each school does have a, a board of governors mm. and they are responsible for, as you said, for the head teacher um, and also for overseeing the budget and for the strategic plan. And so these um, interventions that need to come from goals that are embedded in the strategic plan or the school improvement plan. Um, so they need to come from, you know, from the top. Um, if we just wait for school leaders to do this for themselves, then progress is going to be much slower. And, you know, most of the work that I'm doing with, with schools that get it are with groups of schools that are managed by um, independent boards that are responsible for 5, 10, 15 schools and they take a big picture approach, much, much more like the corporate world. Mm. And so, I, you know, I think this is where a lot of the role models will come from that we've yeah, talking with, about. I guess with a lot of the international schools you work with, you know, um, the, there's consortiums that own yeah. groups of international schools that come from other parts of business, right? They're in other industries as well. So they'd bring yeah, some I, of that knowledge. 
that's become much, much more popular over the last 10 to 15 years. When I first went into international schools, that didn't really exist. And now we have especially these um, schools that started in the UK, you know, as independent schools have now developed huge groups of consortiums um, with schools in multiple locations across Asia and the Middle East. Um, and a lot of the best work, I think, is coming from them. Um, and they have bigger budgets. And they also have people working within their organization who've come from the corporate world, mm. have been working in this for 20 years or more. And to them, it's kind of obvious. Whereas in schools, we're very behind in, in our thinking, you know, very behind. It's yeah. Very, very, very 20th century. Um, so I guess just circling back to workload and you've sort of talked to some of this um, a little bit already, but recognising that it is, a, you know, sort of top two risk factor for both school leaders and teachers. Um, are there some sort of key reasons why that high workload is consistently there? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, the expectations placed on schools have completely transformed over the last 50 years. And that means that the work of school leaders and the work of teachers has transformed. So schools are no longer places where just learning takes place. Um, you know, from a political perspective, schools are now the primary vehicle for um, addressing social disadvantage. Um, you know, even though governments are consistently implementing policies that, you know, perpetuate inequality, they expect schools to address this. And that brings a lot of pressures. Um, you know, what we also have is an increasing accountability culture, where as schools have been given, been given greater autonomy, it's what's called school-based management since the 1970s, in order to prove to government that they're doing a good job, they have to jump through a whole bunch of accountability hoops. And that brings a lot of paperwork and administration and takes teachers and leaders away from their work in the classroom. You know, schools are also no longer, they're multiple service providers, you know, that they provide before and after school care um, and meals. Um, they're providing uh, alongside um, other external agencies. They're providing a whole range of therapies, you know, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, play therapy, mental health services, welfare services, child protection. We've also had a huge proliferation in recent years of students with special educational needs and mental health needs, um, which, and the school is really the focus for addressing those. So that's also happened. Um, we have increasing issues of funding around schools, which means we have staffing cuts um, with teachers, teaching assistants, support staff, um, class size is creeping up, so there's just more work to do with less people to do the work. Um, we could probably do a 90 minute podcast just on this. You know, there are multiple and complex factors, many of them political, um, that having caused the workload of those in schools to increase considerably over the last several decades. Um, and that's just a kind of snapshot, really, of some of my thoughts around the issue. Yeah. Um, have you seen any schools come up with sort of novel approaches to address some of these workload issues? Yeah, this is interesting to see what schools do. I came across a school the other day, actually, in London, who has a no marking policy. So teachers don't do any marking. Um, I've also seen quite a lot of schools. It's becoming more popular now for the, for teachers to have a, for the kids to have a four and a half day week. So they would go home, let's say, for example, early on Friday at one o'clock or 1230. And then teachers have half a day for planning and collaboration. Um, in Europe, I'm not sure if you know this, but in Europe, in the state school system, it's much, much more common for teachers to only come into school to teach their lessons. And they stay at home for the rest of the day to plan and mark, you know, lessons and mark student work. And then they have other individuals on site who are responsible for the pastoral care. So teachers are 
responsible for learning and someone else is responsible for the pastoral care. So, you know, those are some ways with teachers, um, with school leaders. There's a growing interest in shared leadership models. Um, I mean, co-principalships go back to the 70s, um, but there's a growing interest in co-principalships, co-headships. Um, it's still thought of as being pretty out there and progressive. Um, also, delivery, de um, developing collaborative cultures, which I've already mentioned, so that we're dispersing leadership and um, expanding senior leadership teams has become very popular, you know, obviously with schools that can afford it. So you're taking on new roles like director of learning or director of admissions or director of operations so that some of those whether they be academic roles or non-academic roles that the the school leader is expected to be responsible for are being done by someone else um, and we're seeing that increasingly in independent schools um, and in international schools big senior big big slts much more like what you find in the corporate world um, so those are some of the ways that um, schools you know more novel ways that schools are dealing with these issues um coaching has become very big in schools it's not always very successful uh peer coaching models with teachers um limited success i would say um professional coaching for school leaders is becoming more popular and there's some really there's becoming a real foundation of evidence now to show the impact on well-being for school principals and head teachers of coaching with a professional coach and so that's becoming more popular so yeah those are some of the things that are happening out there yeah i can see how the um the co-principal or the coach model would help with some of that um sort of the isolation um issues that um that the school principals or leaders deal with absolutely yeah, I was um, involved in school governance for about six years, and uh, I really liked the model that we had at, at the school. We had two primary schools and a secondary, so we had a head of secondary, two head of well, you know pr principals for the primary schools, and then we had a CEO. And the CEO's yeah. main responsibility was make sure that the ship runs, uh, whereas the principals were in charge of curriculum, right? Because that's yeah. you know in their background. Uh, and then they, we had like a director of finance as well who'd take care of all the enrollments and financial stuff so um yeah get get principals to all you know head teachers to do what they do and that is you know focus on good curriculum um and get a business manager <laughs> to manage the business of, of the school yeah, uh, i absolutely. thought that was much better use of skill sets that's very similar to the model that you will see in most large international schools although sometimes they do have a director of learning or a director of curriculum who also oversees that aspect of things um just because if you know a school of two or three thousand students um where learning where students are going from age three up to age 18 it's probably unrealistic to expect one head teacher to be a, to be an expert in learning across that whole age range but it's that's definitely much more the model that you see in independent schools because a lot of public schools state schools um just quite simply don't have the financial resources mm. to enable that to happen um, you know, although there's a lot of good research to show that a um, director of finance or a business manager actually makes their makes their money back in the first three mm. years, you know, so there is data out there to help us. Um, I think a director of development, which is fund what they're called fundraising in schools now, um, they're definitely earning their salaries plus in you know yeah. in raising so that you know there's that the, the, there's some kind of bottom line factors there that schools can latch on to to see that actually um it's in the long run it's probably going to cost them less yeah big, big business managers you know they easily can make their money back in a school it can be so much waste um within a school financially um so if you have someone who's got good controls over that then um you know easily they can make their money back i would be surprised if they didn't do it in the first year <laughs> but yeah. um it, importantly it takes that load off say a head teacher who maybe comes from more of an education background and hasn't got the bench business management i mean you know we're talking about schools not with like you know a million dollar two million dollar budgets you know a lot of these have 10 million dollar 
plus budgets, these uh, independent schools, not even really large ones, you know, it's a medium sized kind of school. So you've got a, you know, someone who's kind of graduated from a teacher into school leadership, and now all of a sudden, they've got to manage a $10 million budget. It's, um, you know, a pretty significant jump. Absolutely. You know, what we're seeing in state schools where there's less money to go around for these roles, um, are schools sharing a business manager, for example. Um, In the UK, you know, we've moved over to this academy system and we're grouping schools together much more now. And so we're able to kind of share resources among schools and, you know, you've got economies of scale there. So a lot more schools now do have access to somebody who supports them with the finance but there are, you know, many, many other roles, um, and some of the big, biggest schools um, have huge SLTs with all kinds of roles. Um, and then, of course, the problem of the uh, the head teacher is then to to manage all of these people within the SLT and to manage this huge leadership team, which comes with its own challenges. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I guess, where um, you know we're coaching. Uh, would really benefit right bringing in external kind of viewpoints and the chance for reflection uh, as well on what practices are working and what aren't and other p- professional development opportunities that the the head teacher or principal might need uh, to be able to meet the demands of the role um yeah look H- helen it's been a, a really fascinating discussion as as i said early on i don't think we could have asked for a much better person to really explore this topic with given your background um, actually, what, one question we always ask uh, all of our guests, which I'm interested to hear from you is, you know, looking into the future, what would your hopes be for the future of workplace mental health? Yeah, well, I mean, we've alluded to it a little bit already, haven't we? I mean, what we want is a, what I hope to see in my lifetime is uh, a situation where mental health in schools is viewed in the same way, you know, the, 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 the risks are viewed in the same way as the risks of health, physical health and safety. Um, and that there's a legislative framework to address this, to, um, you know, a stick as well as a carrot, if you like, um, to, to force schools, to force employers generally to take these risks more seriously. Because, you know, this isn't just about the workplace. This is about society, isn't it? You know, um, to be a happy and functioning and successful society. We need people who can sustain a good work-life balance so they have time to spend with their families. They can experience happiness and joy on a regular basis. They can be, uh, they can realize their potential rather than just being exhausted and unwell. Um, And, you know, that's the kind of utopia, I guess. Um, Yeah, and then hopefully get the contagion effect, like you say, for school teacher well-being and student well-being as well by having the head healthy and and well absolutely yeah um i'm not sure whether it's realistic to think we'll see that in my lifetime i'm in my late 50s now um but it would be nice to you know it'd be nice to think that 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 um we would have some kind of legislative framework in place i think that's what i would hope for the most yeah so we might be closer in australia than what you are in, in the uk um to that but uh yeah look we we've seen schools move very quickly when they've had to right when the whole business model of schools was threatened because of a pandemic they worked out how to do it remotely and that was something that would never have been considered a possibility before the pandemic um so you know when someone goes well enough's enough you know we can't have all these teachers burning out and becoming unwell and school teachers just uh, school heads you know you know really suffering really badly with their mental health yeah, surely someone's going to call enough's enough and we need really big change, not just incremental change. We need a, a really large change with how we consider well-being. That, that needs to come from government, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, well, hopefully the changes in Australia will uh, kind of spearhead things and get the attention of uh, other governments around the world as well. Mm. hope so. So, Helen, the other question that we ask all of our guests is, do you have any words of advice for listeners who want to work in this field of um, psychological health and safety? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think that it's very important work and it's very rewarding work, but I think that you have to know your limitations and I think that you have to work very hard um, at study and gaining knowledge and experience to make sure that you're not, um, you know, offering services that you're not qualified or experienced enough to offer. 
So, you know, I think it's about taking it seriously and getting qualified and knowing your stuff. And, you know, I know quite a lot, um, a lot of people contact me, hundreds and hundreds of people contact me, you know, in an average month um, to share their stories. And there are a lot of school principals and head teachers now who are requalifying as psychologists and counsellors and professional coaches to support school leaders in their work. And, you know, I really admire and respect them. And um, what we need are um, people with the right skills and qualifications and knowledge base. Um, so that would be my advice to people is, is you know, make sure that you've got those qualifications and skills and knowledge base in place. I think that's important. Yeah, and um, excellent advice to uh, know, know what your limits are and, um, you know, what's outside of your, um, the, the scope of your expertise. Absolutely. You know, I have people come to me to ask for coaching and, you know, I'll coach people. I was a school leader, but I'm not a professional coach and I'm not qualified to coach people um, and to I wouldn't charge money for that, you know. So I think we need to know what our limitations are and be fair to people who, who when they approach us, are highly needy and vulnerable. And we need to make sure that we protect them rather than um, take advantage of that. Yeah, and there's an element of knowing... Um... Have, I guess having a um, a black book of referrals, I guess. So knowing, you know, what's outside of my scope and who do I know in my network who can actually do this so that I can refer on when I need to. Absolutely. And, you know, when you've been doing this, even if it's just for a couple of years, you do build up a lot of knowledge of what's out there and um, who people are saying good things about and uh, able to point people in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, well, Helen, it has been a fantastic uh, conversation with you. Um, where can listeners find out more about your work? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I hang out there a lot. Um, they can go to my website, The Positive Principle, which is drdrhelenkelly.com. Um, those are the two places that you'll find me mostly. Um, they can also find me on Facebook, The Positive Principle. I've kind of given up Twitter for now. <laughs> I went through a big Twitter phase, but um, LinkedIn's grown a lot over the last few years, and I find it a very helpful kind of um, platform. Um, so, yeah, um, or you can go onto my website and you'll, there'll be a contact form there and an email address. And I really love hearing from people. So by all means, reach out to me. Um, let me know what's happening with you. Yeah, we'll definitely put a couple of your links up on the uh, show notes when we publish the podcast as well, particularly um, to the article that this this podcast episode will probably be named after because mm. it's such a such a catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't um, take credit for that, as I said at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, great. Now, Helen, it's been fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, but listeners, that brings us to the end of the episode. So remember, we do video these things when we chat with our great guests. So you'll be able to catch the video if you like on the Flourish DX YouTube page. Uh, you'll also see some snippets coming out over the coming week on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page. Uh, like Helen, Joel and I probably frequent LinkedIn probably a little bit too much, but that's how we find great people like Helen. It is, it is great to uh, find people who are talking and, and kind of leading the discussion in this area. So if you want to continue the conversation, uh, LinkedIn is a great place to do that with Joel and myself and by Helen as well, by the sounds of it. But that brings us to the end. We'll catch you next episode.